Hello, hello, and happy weekend, everyone. We made it. We made it through the week. It was a little bit challenging, but we made it through. Hope you guys had a really great week. I had a fun slash yet challenging week. Uh, hello, Mark. Hello, James. Nice to see you guys. Welcome back. Uh, the weekend, uh, I don't know what you guys got going on the weekend. I'm hoping that I will get an opportunity to go to the beach finally. Uh, for me, summer, summer somehow hasn't really kicked in yet. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to make summer kick in for me. Uh, and I think I want to celebrate for me until I go to the beach, summer has not officially begun. So I, I must go to the beach to confirm uh, that summer has indeed become begun. Um, I have an incredibly, incredibly special guest today. Um, he has his interview with Roger Stone has gone viral uh, since last Saturday. Last Saturday, I had a big show, and apparently Mo Kelly had a really big show, too. Uh, the amazing uh, Mo, the bra- brilliant Mo Kelly is going to be our guest today. He's going to come on and talk to us about that now infamous interview with Roger Stone and everything that followed after it. Um, and uh, I want to I wanna just kind of spare. I wanna just want to just kind of set the stage about what's been happening ever since the interview. But Mo's going to be here. Uh, he's going to be joining us soon, and I'm very, very excited to have him on. Um, and, you know, I, um, I'm just, uh, I, I, I've always loved Mo. I've known Mo for a while now. Mo Kelly and I have become friends, and he's just, he, he's just a brilliant man, okay? Um, and uh, for somebody uh, as a, a convicted felon, such as Roger Stone, uh, to try to minimize my friend uh, to uh, the light version of the N-word uh, is uh, seriously uh, infuriating, to say the least. Uh, so uh, we are definitely going to talk about that. We're definitely going to confront the issue of, of how my friend was treated by a convicted felon, uh, pardoned by another uh, criminal that also happens to be sadly uh, the president of the United States. Uh, and um, I honestly cringe every time I hear that interview uh, with uh, Roger Stone and uh, Mo Kelly. I literally just cringe on the inside because it's um, uh, because it, it, if you have listened to the entire interview, I mean, it's a, a really uh, incredibly done, uh, very, very eloquently uh, questioned and um, conducted interview by the wonderful and amazing Mo Kelly. Um, and uh, then uh, for Roger Stone uh, to kind of throw in a monkey ranch uh, just to, uh, you know, diffuse the situation or to take away um, from the actual issue at hand, uh, which was uh, the actual question questioning that uh, Mo Kelly was conducting with Roger Stone and Roger Stone then uh, made it about something else, which, you know, these, uh, uh, I mean, l- let's not, let's not fool, our, fool ourselves. Okay. We are uh, currently being governed uh, by uh, a narcissist sociopath uh, with, uh, you know, who take no responsibility uh, for anything terrible that they do. Uh, they consistently try to pat themselves on the back um, uh, anything slightly good that happens, they just try to start petting themselves on the back. Uh, and this is where we're at. But in specifically in case of Roger Stone, Roger Stone is absolutely a narcissist. He is absolutely a sociopath. And I would go as far as calling him a psychopath. Uh, and with a bad tan, who's also slept with a reptile at some point since he claims himself to be trisexual, meaning he has tried everything. So he claimed. Um, Mo Kelly uh, handled it brilliantly, uh, and it was nothing short of a consummate professional. I mean, I really urge you to go to the uh, KFI website and listen to the uh, interview that Roger Stone uh, that uh, Roger Stone and Mo Kelly had. I mean, it's really, it's really uh, brilliant uh, the way uh, Mo handles it because Mo doesn't let him off the hook. Mo doesn't uh, detour the conversation about making it about the the that slur that he used against Mo. Um, he he still presses on and he still goes on and asking him the important question, which is what. What was the main reason that he ended up getting pardoned? And, you know, of course, uh, Roger Stone from the beginning of the interview is just lying through his teeth. He's like, oh, um, the, uh, you know, the uh, juror was unfair. Like the jury was made up of unfair people. And I was just unfairly treated. Um, And of course, as you watch it, you're just like, Jesus Christ, man, you lied under oath. 
You lied, okay? For God's sake, you lied to the FBI multiple times. I mean, what do you think that entire Mueller investigation has been about? Uh, I mean, it's just uh, really nauseating. So, um, I mean, let me tell you something. If I never met Mo Kelly or never was even friends with Mo Kelly and I heard that interview, um, I would immediately side with Mo because Roger is a lying turd who's also a convicted felon, which Mo isn't. So just based on that alone, you're just like, I think I know whose side I'm on. Uh, I'm on the side of Mo Kelly. Uh, besides placing a sex ad uh, in the 90s uh, by uh, Roger Stone looking for a stud to join the party with his wife and her phony tits, uh, he claimed to be, um, I shit you not, this is the ad that I, uh, it's it's on Google. You guys should look it up. It's hilarious. Uh, he claimed that he is a uh, well hung, uh, which I fucking doubted. And he claims to be eight plus inches. I doubt if he's barely two inches. Uh, even then, I'm giving him too much credit, quite frankly. Uh, not the way he behaves. I mean, uh, there's no, that's no way. Um, I was watching this new response from Roger Stone today where he claims, I shit you not, I mean, talk about gaslighting. I mean, these people, Trump, all his uh, cronies, all his phony, uh, you know, uh, supporters. They are the biggest goddamn gaslighters, man. Let me tell you something. Uh, I was watching this new response today by Roger Stone where he claims that the audio is edited, okay? And he will have the forensic investigation to prove that he never used that word. Smoke and mirrors, people. Nothing to see here. Smoke and mirrors. Nothing to see here. Roger Stone never said that. Live on air, this man said. When do you think Mo got the time to edit it? I mean, how does that even work? Okay. It's not like the line got disconnected and then he got reconnected. Is that Mo that Roger Stone is on the line with Mo Kelly the entire time? He goes dead silent after using that slur for 40 seconds and then turns around and lies and says, I never said that. That video is, that audio is edited. Uh, I have to conduct for, I mean, the ultimate gaslighters, these people. I mean, it's, it's disgusting. Okay. Trump said that he's getting raving reviews, rave reviews for commuting Roger Stone's sentence. Now, anybody who is in their right mind knows that uh, Trump likes to pat himself on the back a little too much because let's be honest, nobody else will because uh, he has mishandled the pandemic. Just he missed the mark on it uh, just so badly. Uh, the economy is in the dumps. Uh, we have um, an uh, eviction uh, problem that's on its way. Uh, we are talking about a possible recession uh, that uh, people are, that experts are warning that might be worse than the 2008 uh, recession. I mean, we have a really big problem. Uh, yeah, Mark, I agree with you. Roger Stone is insane. And I was thinking like half an inch. You're right. I, I'm thinking it's just a hole, quite frankly. Uh, it's just a hole. And that's all it is because he is an a-hole. Um, Roger Stone during his interview, uh, said that his jury was unfair. Yes, he is innocent because, um, he said because it had no, I shit you not. He said because it had no African Americans on it. Yet he chose to call Mo a Negro because Roger Stone isn't a job. Yeah, he really cares about diversity and fairness. I can tell, right? That's how you care. That's how you care when you don't have African-Americans on your jury because I'm so concerned. That is how I'm going to get justice. And then you turn around and the very man who's interviewing you, the radio host, the brilliant radio host with a 30-year incredible professional uh, track record is called live on air, a derogatory slur. Yes, sir. I really believe you, Roger Stone. Yeah. Let's go back to who's a convicted felon. It ain't Mo. It's you, Roger Stone. You're the convicted felon. Okay. Roger wants to get Trump reelected. And uh, you and I know God, hell no. For, for, for the love of God, no. Okay. Uh, let's not forget that he also, uh, Roger Stone, uh, has a tattoo uh, on his back of President Nixon. Yeah. Because he loved the man so much. 
another corrupt human who was forced out of office, right? Trying to undermine the constitution, trying to undermine democracy, right? Uh, also another criminal. So of course, criminals know other criminals. So he has a tattoo of Nixon on his back. I personally think uh, that the next tattoo uh, that um, Roger Stone should get should be a tramp stamp of Donald's face on his lower back. So uh, every time he's with that stud, uh, that stud can finish on his back, okay? And just right the perfect spot of that tramp stamp, uh, which I think would be totally appropriate. Um, he claims he's worth only $50,000. He's like, oh, I lost my house. I've, you know, ate, ate, eaten through all my savings. Uh, and I am just in this really dire place. Uh, and I've started a, you know, crowdfunding uh, because I want to raise a million dollars to pay for my legal fees. Uh, and I think he's only raised up to a hundred thousand dollars because nobody, not his, not a Trump supporters want to pay for little Roger Stone's, uh, you know, uh, lawyer fees. He doesn't want to pay for his uh, legal fees. Oh, poor Roger Stone. Oh, life is hard for you. Um, my God. Uh, although previously, uh, Roger Stone's net worth was listed as five million dollars, which I thought was actually kind of uh small, considering uh how many um uh bullshit presidents, including the current one, uh, that he has helped get elected. So five million dollars. I don't know how sharp uh, Roger Stone really is, quite frankly. Uh, five million dollars. I think it's more than that. Hey, maybe. Maybe he has some of that money stash on the Jeffrey Epstein Island, huh? That's possible in the little treasure box um, next to next to some of the, the vibrators. I don't know. It's very possible. Um, yeah, so the truth is that Stone is a convicted felon, okay? Whether he wants to believe it or not, I don't give a shit, even if he's pardoned by the president of the United States. It is a fact. The fact remains that... Roger Stone is a convicted felon, and so he will remain to be a... Just because uh, his buddy, who happens to be the president of the United States, has pardoned him and, you know, commuted his sentence, it does not make him not guilty. Uh, President Trump can come out and say that he's getting rave reviews for... uh, I don't know who the fuck he's getting rave reviews by. Who, like, uh, I I don't know, Manafort? Who is he getting rave reviews by? Uh, Other criminals? Uh, Who? who, by, By Putin? Is Putin sending him congratulation, congr- congratulatory roses on pardoning um, on Roger Stone? Probably, probably. Let's also not forget uh, the why the investigation was conducted in the first place. Okay, uh, I mean, uh, he used. I mean, uh, listen, Trump used his clemency power pardoning his trash friend, Roger Stone. And that's the freaking truth. Okay, even Mueller came out and said, he said the following, and I quote, he said, he remains a convicted felon, and rightly so. The women and men who conducted these investigations and and prosecutions acted with the highest integrity. uh, Claims to the contrary are false, end quote. Okay, this is what uh, Mueller had to say, and rightfully so. Now, if Trump didn't pardon Stone, he would have to go to prison, okay, plain and simple. I mean, uh, uh, listen, uh, innocent black men and women uh, go to prison for years and years on, like, the tiniest of charges, okay? There are the pr- our prison system, first of all, needs a serious reformation. That's number one. And number two, we have a lot of um, innocent black men and women uh, and people of color uh, who are uh, in uh, prison for um, nonviolent offenses, for um, just getting high, just getting high. I mean, Jesus Christ. I mean, I I get high. Uh, I'm a big fan of the marijuana because I have insomnia and it helps me go to sleep. So uh, does that make me a criminal in some states? Apparently it does. And especially if you're a person of color, uh, you know, the, the charges against you will be pressed uh, to the fullest extent. So let's not also forget that there are, um, you know, innocent, uh, just just for getting high. And these people are, are just buried into the system. Uh, these uh, innocent uh, folks who are buried into the system and, and the justice system uh, is, uh, you know, there's two two different kinds of justice system. We all know, okay? I, I mean, clearly, uh, Roger Stone's pardoning and commuting of his uh 
prison sentence is an absolute uh, display, an example of two justice systems, okay? Uh, if you are a corrupt, despicable, lying, uh, sociopathic, narcissistic piece of trash uh, who helps get another corrupt, narcissistic, sociopath a piece of trash elected as the president of the United States, yeah, your buddy's going to come back later and pardon you. Why? Because you have way too many secrets on him. You have way too much information about how he got elected, okay? Um, let's not also forget that Stone repeatedly lied and obstructed justice about his contact with known Russian operatives and WikiLeaks over a stolen email. So uh, the truth is that Roger Stone, um, and we all know that Russia has been uh, confirmed to have, uh, you know, uh, probed and basically uh, interfered in our election process. And let's not be fooled here, people. They're going to try to do it again. They're going to try to, again, try to undermine our constitution. And they're going to try to undermine our democracy by bringing back another corrupt a uh, human being that just got pardoned by the name of Roger Stone. I don't even call him a human being. He's like a reptile. He's like a gross reptile, which con- kind of is an insult to reptiles in a way. But he's g- gross, okay? Uh, and the fact that, I mean, just the level of gaslighting that goes on with this man is just absolutely repulsive. Now, um, I don't know how many of you guys have uh, listened to the audio uh, of what um, Roger Stone, uh, how Roger Stone lies and how what Roger Stone says, but I, I highly recommend uh, that you listen to it. I hope I'm not uh, paused here. Let's see. Am I paused? I hope not. Um, oops. I don't know what's going on here. Can you guys hear me? I hope so. Um, my computer is having a moment. Uh oh. Uh oh. Whoops. Can you guys hear me? I don't know what happened there for a second. I think I lost you guys there for a second, but I'm back. Sorry. I don't know what happened. I was just trying to, I was trying to play uh, the audio uh, by Roger Stone. uh, And then my computer like literally had a stroke. My computer's like, I cannot play that audio. Uh, I think even my uh, laptop is getting sick of it. So um, uh, we're we're definitely going to have Mo Kelly uh, shortly. And uh, I just have so many questions for Mo Kelly uh, since this video. I mean, uh, please Google it. I mean, it is all over the news. I mean, it's in Deadline. It's on CNN. It's like everywhere. I mean, I've looked it up everywhere. And the interview is just everywhere. Um, uh, Stone has uh, helped. Um, you know, Russia get involved in our election process and help uh, the very corrupt uh, president uh, known as President Trump, sadly, uh, get elected and uh, doing the horrific things that he's doing. Uh, it's interesting, you know, now Trump has come out and said that, oh, you know, wear your masks. It's patriotic. Wear your masks. And now all of a sudden, all his Trump supporters are like, oh, my God, 56 percent of Trump supporters are coming out and saying that they will now wear the mask. Okay, and even then Trump was like, you know, there's a time and place for it. Yeah, yeah. You know what? Also, a time and place is when you go outside and connect with different people. Wear the freaking mask, man. Why do we constantly have to? Why is this a fight? Why is poor Dr. Fauci? Okay, and honestly, I love Dr. Fauci. He kind of looks like the Keebler guy with the cookies. I think he does. I I, I adore him though. Uh, but um, man, our amazing uh, our amazing guest. I'm so excited about this interview because I always go on his show uh, and talk a lot of uh, talk a lot of talk a lot of smack. Uh, and now now I have him here. So uh, listen, the language is free flowing. Um, and this man needs no introduction. I've literally dedicated three episodes to him. So uh, the wonderful and brilliant uh, Mo Kelly. Mo, welcome. It's good to see you, Mona. It's always good to see you. How you been? A uh, man, I am okay. How are you? Um, I'm exhausted. Um, oh it's it's weird when you wake up one morning and you're trending worldwide. That's that's really hard to explain to someone. And yeah. you know, you see yourself, and I don't say this as a boast. I'm saying it out of fear. You mm. see yourself in the New York Times, New York Post, 
um, LA Times, USA Today, Hollywood Reporter, yeah. TMZ, Variety, name it, Daily Beast. It, it didn't matter. And my job is to cover the news. And then you realize that you, on this one occasion, you are the news and it gives you some pause. It gives you mm. um, a real gut check as far as the power of media and words and how they can be used for both good and evil. And it was, yeah. it was an eye opening experience. Yeah. I mean, uh, you've just been all over. I mean, I, I mean, I've listened to, uh, you know, your, your post, uh, you, you did a whole unpacking of the interview. That was amazing. You were on uh bill Handel show and I was listening to that. I mean, you know, bill Handel said something that was really fascinating to me. Uh, and, um, I don't, I don't know if you felt that way when he was talking to you. Uh, he said something that really, he said, you know, uh, I don't know how you kept your composure because I would have lost my, you know, I would have gotten really angry. Bill Handel said that. And it really, I just kind of stopped and I thought about it. I was like, you know, if you're a person of color in this country, especially if you're a, a black man or a black woman, you don't really have, you've never really been given that luxury to just lose your shit. No. And it would have been used against me. I would have been the angry exactly. black man who would have been blowing it out of proportion That's or right. somehow just lost my cool, even though it might have been. I mean, I did lose my cool and I'm still yeah, being maybe. accused of losing my cool or crying racism, even though in the in the interview I said I, I never called you a racist, Roger Stone. Right. And, the, and that's the unfortunate part, because the racialized pejorative was dismissing my humanity. Yep. And part of my humanity is being allowed to respond to insults when they happen. And it's always turning the other cheek as opposed to, you know, give them a right cross verbally or otherwise. And yeah, internally it was there. And you talk about people of color in America. This is the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. We are so used to being marginalized, disrespected, disregarded and dismissed. When it happens again for the nth time, it doesn't get a rise out of you. We just say that's Tuesday in America. <laughs> I've received worse in terms of tweets, yep. emails, yep. Um, phone calls to the station, messages. So well, it, you, you have to put it in its proper context, not only the remark, but to whom it was made. And what my life has been, I was called the N word, the, the real N word, the, you know, the, the fat version of the N word when I was a, a first day of kindergarten. I'll never forget it by a fifth grader. Wow. Those are the things which stay with you for life wow. and they leave an indelible mark. Yes. What, how long ago was that? That was 45 years ago. Have we yeah. changed that much? Yes and no. Yes yeah. and no. Yeah. There's things we have other things we haven't. Where did you go to school? Well, uh, I grew up in the Torrance area and Torrance is or has a reputation. I mean, you can Google Torrance racism. Even today, they had a, a big um, racist video where uh, this couple stopped a mixed couple, black man, Latina woman couple pulled in front of them, got out and said, white lives matter, got out with a hammer or something, started beating on their car. This was just yesterday. Yesterday, in the what? same area in which I grew up, Torrance has a very complicated yet notorious history when it comes to dealing with issues of race or people of color living in that specific area. And I went to South Torrance High School, class of 87. I'm not ashamed of it in any way, but I'm also very acquainted with yeah. some of the issues of the city. Yeah. I mean, um, you're, you're, uh, I mean, do you remember what your response was? Did you even say something back? Oh, yes, I did. I, I tried to beat the shit out of the kid. <laughs> right? And it was a fifth grader because my father had already prepared me for that moment. I was made, I was one of the first black males in the Torrance School District. And this is 1973. Wow. So I was one of the first black males. And I know most of my, classmates had never seen a black person this is america we're talking about they had never seen a black person and so my father prepared me as best he could in my limited imagination as far as understanding race prepared me if i heard this or someone did that he told me what to do and it was very interesting because the advice that he gave me back then it was a different time we're just coming out of the 1960s civil rights riots and everything right. and so it, it he was more protecting me emotionally and also, if need be, physically, if I should need to respond. 
Yeah. And so he told me, do whatever you need to do. If and, he, and I'm saying this seriously, if you have to pick up a brick, so be it. Good but time. protect yourself at all times. So I tried to beat the crap out of the kid. I couldn't catch him because he was physically older and just faster than me. But but he turned tail. That's for sure. I bet. Did you uh, th- did it ended up like getting reported to the principal's office or anything like that where they sided with you? Like what, what was that like? It was a different world. It's like report that. I mean, I can't count how many times that has been thrown around by me, at me, to me, at different students. There was a um, wow. another student I remember in high school. And there were two white kids on either side of me. It was like government class. Mm. And there was a, another student. I, I think he was from India. I don't remember. I know he was either from East Asia or the Middle East. I just can't remember. Okay. And they were joning on him. And one of them said, oh, you're just a sand in. Yeah. And I'm sitting right there as if I'm not going to be as offended because they're talking about someone else and not me. These are things that just jump out at me. I remember one time when there was a high school talent show and people were doing like air bands and they did the song. Three girls did the song Shout um, from Animal House and they did it in blackface. Well, and the whole crowd just loved it like it was hilarious. And I remember my mother taught at the school and. And she and I just looked at each other because we both knew. And then my mother, I remember she immediately uh, reported it to um, one of the counselors, whoever, and nothing ever happened of it. But to answer your point, just because you report it, it doesn't mean anything. And I say all that to say I have these, a a bag of life experiences, which long precede Roger Stone. So when Roger Stone says, I don't really feel feel like arguing with this Negro or something to that effect, it's like, okay, here we go again. Yeah. It's not new. So to answer your question, how did I maintain my composure? Because the other 5,500 times that I've heard it and I didn't react as well. That's right. That's right, Mo. I mean, uh, you know, I, so uh, the interesting thing about the N word is that I did not know that the N word existed until I moved at the age of 15 from Pakistan. Uh, mm-hmm. And I didn't know what it was. Uh, I remember my brother coming home one day uh, and he had just gotten a job as an insurance salesman at Prudential and he became one of the top salesmen for the month and he knocked off this white guy to the second position. And the and my brother came home and he's like, oh, you know, I, I became the top salesman, but this guy came and called me the sand N-word today to my face. Yeah, yeah. And I was just like, what do you mean? What is that word? And he goes, yo, it's, it's a really bad, it's a very demeaning way of saying, you know, for use against black people. And I was like, oh, so because so I was like, so, so you add a little sand to it and then it's us. And he's like, yeah. So like, does he think that we live near the beach, that there's sand there? I was like, <laughs> you're poor. we can't live near the sand. <laughs> That's trying to make sense out of nonsense. You know, you can't exactly. make sense out of ignorance. Exactly. Because I have no context. Right. I have no context of the N word. So, and then, of mm-hmm. course for reading history and all that, of course, and the history books, they 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 very nicely brush over. Oh, everything was fine. It right. was great. The plant- colonialism was great for all of us. Yeah, yeah. The plantations were awesome. <laughs> it was fantastic. Um, and then you start reading, and as you get adults, and you start reading stuff, and you're like, "Holy moly, this is yeah. some bullshit!" Right <laughs> <now>. <laughs> well, but, but to your point, I remember when I was growing up, the existence of black people, African Americans, in my textbooks could be boiled down to slavery, as in the Middle Passage. They don't talk about chattel slavery, but just slavery as a general vague concept. Mm-hmm. Um, Dr. King and George Washington Carver and his peanuts. That's it. There was no Frederick Douglass. There was nothing, no one else who had any connection to what? anything other than what? just Western colonialism and what? slavery. That's it. I think maybe Crispus Attucks, who died in the Revolutionary War, the first one to die, but that was like a trivia question. I don't think I even learned that he was black until in my twenties or something, you know? I mean, I, I didn't even know that Alexander Hamilton came from the Caribbean. I don't know. Right. And it makes you start looking at history altogether differently. And of course our concept 
of an immigrant is vastly different than maybe 200 years ago. Yeah. But it does tell you as far as what is and what was not valued when textbooks were put together, as far as who was important, what was important. And history is always told by the winners or the colonizers. So that's right. No, no, I, I 100 percent agree. I mean, no mention of Harriet Tubman. I'm like, Harriet Tubman. No. I mean, my God, you know, I don't know. I, did you know that Harriet Tubman used to get these debilitating uh, migraines uh, because she got hit in the head really bad by one of, uh, you know, uh, while while she was uh, under slavery and she would get these debilitating migraines. My brother called me up. He's like, man, this Harry, she's like, man, Harriet Tubman was a badass. And then he's Bad like, badass. Once you start was, learning the history. Woo, yes. She was amazing. I mean, and, yeah. Sorry. And was packing, was strapped. Yeah. After she left the plantation, she was strapped at all times yes. and ready to shoot folks on site. Yes. I mean, just uh, her her history, uh, I mean, her courage is uh, incredible. But, you know, um, I, I want to go back to this point that we were just talking about how in history, how things are just erased because mm-hmm. it's, it's not important. Because let's just talk about what the achievements of white people and just everybody mm-hmm. else is dismissed. Um, let's go. Talk, let's talk about white Jesus for a second. It is okay. so disturbing when I see a blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus. I'm like, OK. We all know that they had to come up with that image of Jesus so they can feel it's relatable. You and I know that if Jesus was this white in the middle of Middle East, he would have spontaneously combusted. Yeah, and I, I'm trying to think how the concept of Jesus, the blue eyed Jesus, yeah. could exist, as you said, in the Middle East and practice a religion opposite of judaism so which was already heresy in and of itself and then you're going to have them look as a european uh, european yeah it's just it's not feasible i mean when i talk about movies like noah and they have russell crowe from from australia and they have a thousand extras who are also european and it's like don't you know that noah and I know a little bit about the Bible. Okay. I've been studying most of my life. Don't yeah. you know that that's set in Mesopotamia? Do I need to point that out where that is on a map for you? Yeah. Do I have to remind you that Egypt is actually in Africa? That's it's right. not, it's not Southern Europe. It's Africa on that's that right. continent. It's not like it's somewhere divorced from Sudan. No, 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 no. It's not sub Saharan, but it's, it's right there. That's right. <laughs> you know, that's right. want to talk about sand, sand, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Egypt is sand. <laughs> I mean, yeah. well, you know, and I know that if uh, Jesus Christ uh, came today and showed up at the Mexican border of America and Mexican border and was just a brown dude with long hair and, you know, was just wearing simple clothes. And he was like, hi, I'm Jesus. I've returned. And they're like, sorry, you're just another immigrant just trying to get in our country. Christianity today in America specifically is not a religion. Yeah, it's a political party. Yes. It's it's a public affirmation, not that you believe that he's the son of God and he died for our sins. You believe that or it's it's a sign that you put on your door saying, I'm not Muslim. That's all it means in America yeah. for the most part. It's not about how you should love your neighbor. It's not about how you should conduct yourself in his likeness or try to model your behavior after him and the behavior which was demonstrated in the Bible. It just says, I'm not Muslim. Yes. That's it. Yes. No other requirement. <laughs> yes. I mean, I, I, I hope that when Jesus does come back this time, I hope he's smoking weed because I think that's the only type the way he's going to get through humanity. He's like, listen, I've been watching you guys. You guys have messed this whole thing up. I'm going to hit this reefer right here, specifically in California. This is some good kush. <laughs> Let me get some of that. Okay. <laughs> you know. But you can kind of see. How and why they would have killed him back in the day just by our behavior today. Yeah. As a world who was just completely out of control, yeah. who would not even accept or believe the Son of God, regardless of how many miracles he might have performed. Yeah. But I could see why Jesus would have to come, regardless yeah. of what you believe. But I understand the context of the world is pretty fucked up at the moment, and I yeah. need to send someone to help straighten them out, or yeah. all y'all are done. Yes, that's <laughs> right. Just start over. That's right. I mean, you know, a lot of people don't know, but Islam, uh, we believe that, uh, you know, we believe that the, when the world comes to an end, it would be Jesus Christ who would come back. So a lot of people don't know that, you know, Jesus Christ is a huge prophet in Islam. He's mm-hmm. a huge, 
he's a huge prophet. I mean, uh, and, and a, a lot of people think that Christ, you know, Christ, Christ is a huge, he plays a huge role in Islam. So when the world comes to an end, I really hope he's coming back with a big bong. Like he's just like just smoking a reefer, a huge bong. He's like, I've had enough with you guys. I know the world's going to come to an end, but let me just hit this reefer right here. But, you know, re- religion has always been about cherry picking. Um, yeah. You know, people who are Christians, they pick the things which are convenient and comfortable, and their God, air quotes, doesn't like the people that they don't like. Yeah. <laughs> and anything that they do which is in opposition to the people that they don't like, yeah. and historically this has always been the case, the yeah. Bible then backs them up. You know, if it happens to be slavery, if it happens to be segregation, if yeah. it happens to be redlining neighborhoods, if it happens to be a Muslim ban, they will use the Bible to somehow justify it yes. when in actuality it is standing in opposition to everything that they believe. So yes. it's, it's just more a political ideology, yes. not a religious ideology. And, you know, it's very interesting because, um, you know, our uh, constitution in our country is supposed to be based off of separation of church and state. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, church has such a huge hand. I mean, especially with right. this administration where they consistently bring, especially Vice Pre- Mike, Mike Pence, he's ta- constantly talking about God and he can't be around other women because he calls his wife mother. Uh, that's is why nasty. I- which is so gross. I, that's why I call him a mother fucker. That's what I call him. <laughs> because he is fucking his mother. So he therefore, is mother, which is therefore, which is <laughs> logic. I am just following the logic here. This is this is not brain. This is not uh, rocket science here, people. Let's do see this. it to a, see it through to its logical conclusion. Exactly. So I'm just like, okay, so you're a motherfucker. So thank you for clarifying that. Uh, and then he's, uh, I, I honestly think like Mike Pence is always just out there uh, looking for a glory hole at a random gas station, but that's just me. Well, I think of it this way. If you look at the people who are most ardently against um, same sex marriage, there's yep. usually something or someone in their closet that yep. they're trying to repress or suppress. That's we correct. see it time and time again. And when people talk about religious freedom, they're not actually talking about religious freedom. Mm. They want to be an unabated political Christian. Going back to what we said, Mm -hmm. they want to be able to espouse their Christian political ideals in their restaurants, in their workplaces, but they don't want anyone else to do that. You know, when someone said to me, I can't remember, but they said, you know, we did bring back prayer in the schools. I said, well, is that just Christian prayer? Mm -hmm. Does that include Muslim prayer? Yeah. Yeah. Or what about what if the teacher's an atheist? Yeah. You know, what what if, if are we talking about Buddhist prayer? Are we talking about Hindu prayer? Because yeah. if it's everyone's prayer, that's fine. But they obviously only mean Just Christian prayer. And I do mean air quotes, Christian yeah. prayer. Yeah. yeah. Because they want that religion to be, you know, they want the theocracy just without all the fuss of yeah. the dictator portion of it. I mean, it's interesting, you know, they're always, always the Bible thumpers always come out and say, well, don't shove your religion down my throat. Well, the, what are you, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we got to make sure we put our hand over our heart and say, in God, we trust. And that's so funny because in God, we trust is in terms of money, wasn't even put on our money until 1957. And if you're actually a Christian, just to say in God, we trust doesn't make you a Christian. That just means that you believe in a higher source, a higher power. It could be the spaghetti monster for all we know. That doesn't mean anything. So when I try to engage Christians, I know if someone's really a Christian or, yeah. if, excuse me, if they're bullshitting or not. Because yeah. if you're a real Christian, yeah. the word Jesus is going to come out of your mouth at some point. Yeah. Because the whole point of being a Christian is you believe that Jesus came and died for all our sins mm-hmm. and then rose on the third day. Yes. After being crucified. Yeah. So when when I hear Donald Trump say Jesus, other yeah. than an exclamation because he's mad, yeah. it'll be the first time. Yeah. I've never seen him say, I'm a Christian, I believe Jesus Christ, and all you know, as far as actually proclaiming with your mouth and believing all your heart that he's the risen son of God. Yeah. yeah. That's what it means to be a Christian. Yeah, there's no other way around it. And all these fake Christians out here saying that they believe in religious freedoms like, no, you don't. You you believe in politics. Yeah, you want those politics to come down on Muslims. That's all you believe. You're not a Christian. Right. Uh, you know, uh, I do want to say that um, Roger Stone also wants the second coming, which is why in the 90s he played that sex ad uh, because he wanted that second coming, too. But (laughs) Well, I always say just wait three or four hours. You can go again. 
<laughs> but did you know he's proclaiming to be uh, yeah. born again? He's saying that he's found his faith. He alluded to it in our conversation a little yeah. bit, but he, he alludes to it. He's born again. And I'm not going to dispute whether he I'm is sorry, or is not. Say, did you say porn again or born again? I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know. If you believe all the rumors, it might be both. Who knows? <laughs> because if you, look at, you look at folks like Jim Baker and Tammy Faye, you, you never know what's going on in someone's ministry, someone's home or whatever. You know. Yeah. And like I said, a lot of times people craft their religion to suit their lifestyle. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I mean, uh, you know, no, uh, I feel like whatever there's a lot of bullshit happening in a government, they always hide behind religion. And and, and that is, a, 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 it's displayed so, uh, uh, you know, obviously, especially in the Middle East and South Asia, where you have leaders who constantly hide behind religion. They're like, I do this in the name of Allah. It's like, uh, no, you're not. I don't. <laughs> You know, you, you just want to get laid, man. Like, right. let's be honest over here. You just want endless, endless pussy being thrown your way. Let's be honest. Let's just talk about it. You know, I gotta say, a whole bunch of virgins is kind of attractive, and you would, you would at least have my yeah. ear. Oh, you know. Not for me. I don't no. want a freaking virgin. <laughs> no, you're talking about the the nuts and bolts of it. I'm just saying the idea of having all sorts of okay, women just of at your beck and call. Them. <laughs> say the last part all those women at your beck and call would be appealing to most men that's all yes. i'm saying yes because they want the harem you know they want the right. harem right they want the access you know it's just like yeah every day you know um so uh, a lot of times uh in you know in islam we have these things called the hadiths hadiths are uh basically written uh hundreds of years after prophet muhammad passed away and it was basically the hadiths were basically created by the followers of prophet muhammad uh to remind muslims of how to live their lives right, right. well of course it's heavily influenced by dudes who just want to get power and money as much plus as they could have get access to right and so some of these hadiths uh talk about how they're like oh when you die and you die in the name of allah and when you go to heaven there's going to be this gorgeous woman with beautiful eyes saying please come here and take my body and when you are done with her there's going to be another gorgeous woman who's going to come and tap you on your shoulder and say take me too and i was like dude this is straight up porn porn yeah mm -hmm. this is religious porn I can see why that would attract some extremists. It makes sense to me. Right? Because you're just like, oh, man, endless getting laid, like endless. You just never run out of energy. You cup just runneth never... over. I mean, my cup runneth way over. Like way Double over. D cups. <laughs> double E, uh, double D. Yeah. We're talking all kinds of cups. <laughs> <laughs> what podcast we're talking about? Uh, no, did you watch this unhinged video of Roger Stone on Now This with the lawyer Larry Clayman? Um, I met Larry Clayman any number of times. I didn't see the video, so I know it was unhinged. So yeah. <laughs> just getting those two together, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh. It is crazy. I just watched it um, about an hour ago. And he's like grinning. Roger Stone's like grinning. First of all, he looks like he borrowed some of that Adderall from Trump because the way he's just like grinning his teeth and like he's like sniff, snort, sniffing. And I was like, oh, man, you got some of that cheap Adderall from Trump. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if there are any substances involved. I just know that um, I wouldn't be surprised if there were. Let me just say that. I don't know what's going on with him, but he has some very weird idiosyncrasies, uh, secrecies, yeah. which are just suggestive of other things let me put it like that well yeah i mean that's been displayed in the 90s with the ad and by the way that ad have you seen i posted that ad. did you see the ad uh, uh, about him okay. ad in the 90s with his wife that he was oh yeah yes yeah uh, and then he talks about his size and i was like get the liar no way there's no way they were living a life, you know if, if i've heard all the rumors and i know that he and his wife were into some stuff you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I always say what you, you like, what you like, uh, you yeah. know, I, wow. it might be Crisco and handcuffs for some people. And it might be, I don't know, baby oil and, and ice cubes and tomatoes. I, I don't know. You know, I think, I think that's, I think you're putting it mildly, mildly right now. I think, I think there's other, I think there's reptiles involved, but that's, <laughs> I think there's reptiles involved. Um, Mo, you were, uh, 
so incredibly uh, composed and eloquent when uh, he says the slur and you were like, uh, you're like, excuse me, what did you say? And then he goes silent for about 40 seconds and then comes back. Uh, what's going through your mind at that time? Oh, I went street, but I was just very polite about it. If you've ever been in a, a physical altercation or on the street yeah. and someone says something stupid, you always give them a, a second to either step up or mm -hmm. step back. Mm -hmm. And it was, and I said, I said very nicely, excuse me, what did you say? But I'm actually saying, motherfucker, what did you say? Yes. Yes, Mo. I say it again. Yes. Say it again. Yes. Yes. That is what internally. Yes. And I'm giving him the opportunity, man to man. If you're going to say it, don't say it under your breath. Exactly. Say it to me. Step exactly. to me. Exactly. Man up and say it. I already know you said it. That's why you say, say what? Exactly. It's not, there's nothing wrong with my hearing. Say it again. Exactly. exactly. Oh, okay. So you're going to back down and deny it. I've already won. Yeah. You punked exactly. out. I mean, listen, we, we, we've all known that he, he's a douchebag and he's a lying scumbag who constantly gaslights. Uh, but I think uh, what really bothered me, and I wanted to fucking punch his lights out, is when he came back and you were like, what did you say? And you were like, did you just call me? You confronted him about the slur. And he okay. goes, you're out of your mind. He goes, you're out of your mind. I mean, just the gaslighting of like, yeah. It's incredible with Trump and his uh, his uh, you know his uh, criminals that he constantly pardons and supports uh, that uh, they are constantly ask for proof and when you show them proof they're like oh didn't happen nope doesn't matter it's it's moving goalposts to your point it's gaslighting I look I have audio which is unassailable the yep. audio integrity yep. is unimpeachable no pun intended it is perfect usually. You have a conversation with someone. You don't have an audio record of what someone says. So there's plausible deniability. Yeah. There is no plausible deniability. Yeah. But he uses the same book that he shared with Trump as far as deny, 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 attack, 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 distract, deflect, whatever. Change the conversation so it's talking about something else or someone else. All of a sudden it became about me and my integrity. Like maybe I somehow doctored the audio. Maybe okay. I had some sort of trick up my sleeve. Maybe that's something I had some sort of ulterior motive as a member of the media trying to somehow embarrass him when he's fresh out of federal custody because I'm a Trump hater. I don't know, but that works for his audience. So I don't even get mad about that stuff. Yeah. And he changed his explanation like four times. First, yeah. it was a categorical denial. Yes. Then it was my engineer had something to do with it and inserted his voice. Then it was like radio interference or something wrong where he couldn't hear me on his end. And then he said that I cut up, uh, cut his mic off three or four times. And I somehow doctored the audio. My thing is this, if I did one or some or all of those things, why haven't I been hit with a lawsuit? Yep. A defamation suit. Yep. Absolutely. You know, like yesterday, we're going on day seven. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what are we talking about? And exactly. I think to a reasonable person, they would say, hmm, yeah, that does make sense. If someone doctored an interview, so the world would look at you as either a racist or somehow a racial jerk. Yep. That would be grounds for a defamation lawsuit. Absolutely. I Absolutely. would love to, I would, I would love to see it. I would dare him to do anything like that. And it's not beyond Roger Stone just to level a lawsuit with no intentions of seeing it through or, or, or winning, but he won't even do that. I mean, like the he won't even follow through on the bare minimum on what he alleges. And so people, he just wants to muddy the water. So it's like oh, to create some sort of doubt in an ignorant person's mind, well, maybe he did doctor it. Maybe he did do something untoward and, and trying to make Roger Stone look bad. Yeah. Remember, He's fundraising right now and yep. negative fundraising works. Victimizing, you know, victimization fundraising always works. See how the, the, the media is always on the side of the left and they're trying to embarrass us. They hate the president. That's why I need your $20 right now. <laughs> it works. Yeah. And I understand it just working in the business long enough and also working in politics. Yeah. That's how things are done. It doesn't make me mad. Yeah. I, I, I think well, I think uh, what makes me really mad is that I have known you for a bit now, uh, and you are an absolute person of integrity. You are brilliant at what you do. You are a consummate professional, uh, and I think it really boiled my blood uh, when I heard that audio because uh, uh, 
I'm not gonna lie, it made it made me want to do some jihad, man. <laughs> you know, don't get me wrong. There's a side of me which was angry. Yeah, but we don't have to necessarily give in to that anger. Yeah, I knew this is radio. This is not a conversation in the hallway. If it were a conversation in the hallway, I wouldn't have had someone to be able to verify. Like, yeah, he said it. I had the audio. It was a radio conversation. That's right. I had the audio. I already won at that point. Yep. Even though I heard it, and I at the moment I wasn't one hundred percent sure. I mean, we all had to listen to the audio a few times. Yes. And then you realize, oh yeah, he said it. But I knew since I had the audio, there was no need for me to to get into an argument there about whether he said it or not. It's already on tape at that point. Right. I'm good. Go right. ahead and finish the conversation. Maybe right. you'll get something else which is actually meaningful. Yeah. I did want to ask him and did subsequently ask him whether he had been in touch with the Trump administration. Yes. Prior to being commuted. That's important. Yes. You know, yeah. th- that's relative to whether you were scheming and conniving and coordinating, whether you're going to get a pardon or a commutation and when it was going to be done. I would yeah. rather he- have him on the public record than him just hanging up at that moment. And yes, I thought about hanging up on him just so I could tell him where to get off and everything, but it would not have the larger purpose of having him on in the first place. He's here. Just go ahead and finish. And yeah, I had an internal struggles, like whether I should have just cussed him out and hung up on him or, or what. Yeah. And that could have been satisfying on a certain level, yeah. but I think as it's played out and it's been reinforced, I handled it the right way. Not needing to pat on back, but it was just the right thing to do at the time. Hundred percent, and I think Mo, you uh, you touched upon it, or uh, you know, in the beginning of this conversation, which is, look, if you had cussed him out, it would have been about angry black man. Yes. The, the focus would have completely, he would have taken and just ran with it, right? Mm-hmm. But you didn't give him any ammo. You were just like, oh, you, you just hung yourself and I'm just going to sit back and I'm just going to continue on doing what That's I need right. to do. Right. And he's come at me personally, said, you know, all sorts of things. I need to like to learn black history. I need to get the wax out of my ears. Uh, I don't respond or react to any of it. I hear it. I'm aware yeah. of it. But yeah. I, I'm not going to be him at his dirty tricks as far as how he handles the media. I can't be a professional in the conversation and then mm-hmm. decide to get into the mud in the days after the conversation. Either you're going to yeah. be a professional and handle it upright and circumspect or you're not. Either right. you're going to be the Christian that you profess to be or you're not. It's really yeah. that simple. And it doesn't mean that it's comfortable or convenient. It just says, if you want to be perceived a certain way, then be that way. If you right. want him to be able to say that he got under your skin, well, then let him get under your skin and, and go into a back and forth of personal insults. And then you would yeah. have given him his victory. I mean, he's Christian, uh, like I'm Norwegian. Uh, let's, uh, let's be. <laughs> yeah, we can call ourselves whatever we want. Listen, I'm Norwegian. Uh, you know, I uh, identify as white uh, now because Roger Stone identifies as Christian, apparently. I mean, That's holy right. shit. Why what not? <laughs> I have blonde hair and blue eyes. I don't know. I don't know what you see. I don't know what you see, Mo, but uh, that's what I got, man. That's You're out of your I mind. Got. You're out of your mind. I'm Norwegian. Why not? No. What are you talking about? This is this is how I identify. Um, he uh, There was a video today of uh, one of the channels uh, interviewed him, and they asked him. Uh, he's like, yeah, I, I knew, I'm getting a forensic investigation done on the mm-hmm. tape. The audacity, man. The audacity. So I had the... So it, uh, the forensic investigation, I mean, first of all, it's total bullshit. You and I know. Of course I mean, it is. There's, of course it is, there's, right. no, there's no fucking like to stand on. Stand on uh, yeah. He's a fucking moron. Uh, but um, so h- how does that work? What, they they reach out to uh, KFI and say, hey, we need uh, we need the audio. We're going to do a forensic investigation. Like, how does that even You're work? You're way too smart. You're the first person to actually ask me this. They've never requested the original audio. God. Like if you were to, for everyone who's watching, if you want to see whether a photo was doctored, whether it was Photoshop, you need to go yeah. to the actual original photo. You just can't. He's just taking a, 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 a I guess, the podcast or whatever. That's right. You know, whatever. Oh. But but not only that, that would have been done inside of 30 minutes, <laughs> not right. two weeks. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. 
I mean, mm. if you're going to conduct a forensic investigation, the first thing you'll do is you'll subpoena and you'll say, hey, we need access to the original audio. Let's That's right. It's just fluff. It's just bullshit. Um, so uh, is that something, Mo, that you're considering and coming out and putting out a statement that, hey, they haven't even requested the original audio? How the hell are you going to conduct an investigation? Well, I can tell you this. If and when he comes to the conclusion and offers his findings, we are already prepared to embarrass his findings. Already. Right. Already. Since he put it out there, you know. Yeah. Yes. we're ready for whatever he's going to announce because we know how this is going to go. He's going to have right. fun. If he takes it further, there'll be some person to say, aha, my expert has said X, Y, and Z. It was doctored. He won't provide any yeah. evidence. He won't be able to substantiate it, but that's what he'll say because that's how politics works. Let's look at our president. He just says shit, never provides any evidence, that's never right. substantiates anything. Mail-in ballots are just fraught with fraud. Where? Yeah. When he just says it emphatically as if it's the truth. And remember, Roger Stone was a close advisor to Donald Trump. The playbook is almost exactly the same. Right. I'm, uh, you know, I was in Young Turks uh, a year or so ago, and uh, one of the things that I was talking to Anna and Jenk about was how Roger Stone was the brains behind coming up with the mnemonic device, which they came up with build a wall. It was wall. That's right. Stone went to Stanford uh, and to uh, Steve Bannon, and then they came up with build a wall. And Trump initially was very hesitant to try it. And then one of the rallies finally remembered because he has a memory of a fucking mouse. Uh, he finally remembered and he chanted build a wall and it just took on like wildfire. And they were like, that's it. We got it. Mm-hmm. That's that's to use. So, uh, I mean, this man has single-handedly contributed to of America far the way we've seen. I mean, you know, um, Mo, Mo, you know, and I know that, uh, you know, somebody like Roger Stone, he knows that if he helps get a corrupt president elected, which he has, but Donald Trump, that he was eventually going to get pardoned. All his Absolutely. crimes were just going away. I mean, he's, yeah. a, he's, a, he's a convicted felon. Like, I don't give a fuck how many times Trump is going to pardon him. He's a convicted felon, bottom well, line. Let me take it one step further. Since his sentence was commuted, there's a slight yeah. distinction between a commutation and a pardon. Pardon wipes everything away, including the conviction. He was just commuted, so he's still a convicted felon, and that stays on his record for life. So you are not saying anything which is facts, factually inaccurate. He is a convicted felon. Yeah. The only thing that changed was the president stepped in and say, okay, you don't have any sentence to serve. That's it. But he's still a convicted felon. And if he were uh, arrested again or charged with something again, that previous record would be relevant going forward. You know, uh, it reminds me of uh, when Chris Rock used to do this joke. He's like, it's all right, because it's all All white. white. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, I was like, man, Mo, imagine, imagine you and I, you or I doing something like this. Not only would they throw our ass in prison, they'll take our families down with us. Like, and, and that's a serious point. It's it's funny, but it's also a serious point. We talk about the inequity of the justice system, and Roger Stone was trying to paint himself as a victim, and he was unfairly treated where he skipped to the front of the line that's right. to get a commutation, and you look at Michael Flynn, a complicit DOJ, yep. intervened on his behalf. Yep. And that same DOJ intervened on Roger Stone's behalf because originally they said that sentence is too long. It has to be that the prosecution was rec- prosecution was recommending seven to nine years. And so mm-hmm. the DOJ, uh, William Barr himself said, no, that's too long. You have to ask for a shorter sentence. And all the prosecutors on Roger Stone's case resigned. What? So and, and Paul Manafort is out of jail right yep. now. So you have to look at all the closest advisors to the president. Yep. Even though they either pleaded guilty or they were convicted, yeah, they are not serving any time in jail. That's not justice. That's right. That's a president making room f- for his friends. That's right. That's it. I mean, uh, you know, it reminds me of uh, what it was like growing up in Pakistan in the sense that, you know, first of all, I grew up under a dictatorship. So that was a uh, very that, that was a lot of fun. You know, uh, it when you see it, then how about that? Listen, when the uh, protests happened for the BLM, and I live two blocks from Melrose Avenue, uh, and when I saw a uh, National Guard in the streets, um, Mo, I kid you not, PTSD is a real thing. It's mm-hmm. a real 
whole mm-hmm. thing. Uh, and I don't think I ex- ever experienced it when until, first of all, I was so scared to go to Melrose Avenue because this happened on Saturday and I didn't go to Melrose Avenue until like Tuesday. I was terrified of going outside. I finally worked up the courage, was driving, saw, I was on the phone with a friend, uh, saw the National Guard and literally stopped talking. I couldn't talk. And I was like, what is happening? I almost regressed back to being an eight-year-old watching and like standing in the corner in Pakistan and watching all the military around me. It was soldiers that- in the streets and, and M, uh, the M 16 carbon. I can't remember the actual guns that they use now, but I'm saying yeah. that tells you this is not normal. This That's is cool. not America. Yes. Yes. I mean, for me, it was just like, this is, this is not the America I know. This is not why my family came to the U S that, we are going to again go through a, a militarized state. Like I, I, that's not why we came here. You know? Uh, I mean, it, it just kind of, it, it really messed with my, I had to hang up because I couldn't talk. My brain just like got stuck. Like mm-hmm. I, couldn't, I couldn't unstuck my brain. And I was like, what happened? And I was later talking to my therapist. I was like, what happened? Why did I get caught? She's like, it's PTSD. And I'm like, that's yeah. real. That is so real. Um, Man, I um I uh, I know that you've been getting interviewed left and right. I saw you with your very dapper bow tie. Uh, <laughs> uh, what? Yeah. Uh, how? What? How was your experience with uh, Joy Reid uh, and being on her show? It's wonderful, only because I've known Joy for a fair number of years now, and I say that in a professional sense. Mm-hmm. I had interviewed her two or three times on my show yeah. in a variety of circumstances, and she's always been gracious. Yeah. And there are a lot of times we'll communicate having nothing to do with her or me specifically in terms of just, hey, how are you doing? Or I saw you do this. Congratulations. I would congratulate her when she got her uh, shot on MSNBC. So we had a legitimate rapport. Yeah. When the opportunity because she had wanted me to come on in previous years for whatever reason. But, you know, in TV, you get bumped. Things happen. Yeah. And this story just kind of exploded. I mean, just exploded. Yes. And then she texts me that morning saying, Mo, I got to bring you on. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm going to have my booker call you. But and she's so nice and humble. She said, do you want to come on? It's like, uh, uh, oh. yes. <laughs> wow. And I was honored to be on her second show ever yeah. in terms of being an anchor host yeah. on MSNBC. And it was a delightful experience i'd done enough tv where once you do enough tv it doesn't really change as far as okay it's a five minute segment yeah. uh, the question will come to you maybe once or twice mm-hmm. regardless of whatever the question is make sure you get out what you want to say yeah and i knew the question was going to be about negro or something like that but i wanted to make sure i took that opportunity yeah. to forward the conversation and talk about something substantive like yeah. the difference between a pardon and a commutation why yeah. Roger Stone is such an important figure right now, mm-hmm. given he's working for an impeached president who was impeached for trying to enlist the aid of a foreign government. And Roger Stone would have been going to jail That's for right. trying to help enlist the aid of a foreign entity. That's you know, right. there's a lot. That's right. There's a lot going on here. And we should not lose sight of that just because of one remark by Roger Stone. Yeah, it's much deeper than that. I mean, Mo, I feel like, um, you know, even though, you know, I mean, you more than more than myself. I mean, I'm a stand up comic. I like, you know, watch stuff and try to, you know, shoot the shit about it and make jokes. But, you know, someone like you, uh, you know, folks who are out in D.C. who are you know reporting the news. I feel like what's happening in D.C., especially specifically in the White House. I think it's way worse than we even know. Oh, I think so, because. We keep seeing every single day yeah. something that we've not seen in our lifetime. We've never had a president um, distrust our own intelligence. We've never had our, a president openly side with a foreign adversary That's right. after they've hacked our election and arguably put bounties on our soldiers. We've never seen that before. We've never seen a president, a sitting president. Yeah. Um turn the FBI into the enemy. We've never seen anything like that. We've never seen a president consistently and intentionally try to divide the country at every single turn. Yeah. 
trying to be as inflammatory as yeah. possible, even during a pandemic. That's why it's like, I believe our, our systems of checks and balances froze because they didn't believe that someone like Donald Trump with his type of temerity would ever become president, That's much right. less try to push it to that degree in his first term, not his second term. In That's his right. first term. That's- you can understand the second term because he's not running for reelection, but his yeah. first term yeah. and he's trying to get reelected. Yes. Unseen, unheard of. That's right. I, I mean, uh, this administration is uh, without a doubt gung ho about dismantling the checks and balances because that's how dictators come into existence, right? Uh, yeah. Dictators come into existence by uh, hiring corrupt people. I mean, he talked about draining the swamp. I mean, he is the freaking swamp. Yeah. Uh, you, know, uh, you bring in uh, relatives, you bring in family members because they're going to cover for you, or you bring the dumbest motherfuckers you can get your hands on. Those are the three. Who happen to be relatives? Uh, who also happened to be uh, so shout out to Eric Trump for being the dumbest <laughs> author. <laughs> uh, but um, I mean, it's uh, and and you know, and and Melania Trump, uh, Melania blink twice. You want us to come get you? Just blink twice, Melania. Be best. Stop that, that, it. I'm sorry. I just believe that's a marriage of convenience at this point. Of course it is. Of yeah. course it is. The, I, I would say Melania Trump is the first uh, gold digging whore in the history of gold digging whores oh, that damn. has to end up working. She has to work for her. Be- I just want the handbags. And now she has to work, man. She has to go out and do campaigns about be best. Like what? That is our first lady. Be nice. She's oh. the first lady of the United States. I mean, how can I be nice, Mel? Come on, I'm a comic. See, I you, know, you, see, Mike, you get to be nice. I, I get to I be nice. I have to be nice. I get to do whatever I want. So that's the fun part. See, that's like the fun, the tension part where I used to get to be like Melania Trump. You know, I, I remember when Trump was talking about uh, buying Greenland. Remember? What was it? Oh, I remember. You remember that? And he uh, buy Greenland and he wanted to sell Puerto Rico. Yeah, he wanted to sell Puerto Rico. And I uh, was actually being interviewed on uh, Sirius XM and they asked me, they were like, uh, you know, what country should we buy, Mona? And I was like, I think we should buy Slovenia because that's where he bought his wife from. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, see, I, see, I'm not fancy like that. I don't have that. <laughs> man. I don't have that, that, that load things that you just. just uh, the bought. full studio, I'll tell you. <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, Mo, so uh, here's a question. What happens? Uh, what happened? Can first of all, I really want to know if uh, if uh, like Roger Stone is coming out and denying that you know it's edited and it's all bullshit right. and all that. Um, you think KFI would ever be interested or even uh, try to uh, sue him for something like that for denying? No, if only because honestly, to see a lawsuit through, you have to show that you have been harmed in some way. Roger Stone is actually, I'm pretty sure, fundraising to a greater degree because he is in the press and people have been interviewing him left and right because they want to ask him about our conversation. And she, he is benefiting from it. I don't think he cares about how he's perceived. He's trying to raise money right. and the way he does that by doing interviews and, and remaining relevant. Right. So that's why I know that the lawsuit will never come because this is actually working for him. And it's actually working for KFI. It's working for me in the sense of we all make it what we want to make it. Yeah. KFI gets added uh, focus and is in every news piece that I'm in, KFI is in, you know. And I think the overall perception of me has been positive. So the overall perception of KFI is yeah. positive regardless of what yeah. Roger Stone wants to say about it. Yes. Yes. So everybody, honestly, everybody wins. Everyone gets to remain true to who they are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. What, whatever that is for Roger Stone. Uh, sure, right. I, don't, I don't think "true" is a word that applies to him. Uh, Mo, what I mean, uh, what I want to know is, like, I, I mean, I'm sure you're getting bombarded. You said you have thousands of emails, and you're just getting, uh, you know. Oh yeah. I mean, so by the way, thank you so much for even taking the time to oh, come. Sure. To this. Um, but um, you're getting bombarded. I mean, what? Uh, He's talking about, uh, he was talking about writing a book that he has to raise money. Uh, yeah. He, you know, and I was looking up his net worth and his net worth was listed somewhere around $5 million. And he, on your, uh, when you interviewed him, he said that he has to sell his house, uh, that he doesn't have money. He has to write a book to raise those funds. Uh, do you believe that? I'm quite sure he has considerable legal bills because his trial mm-hmm. and, trial motions and what he was trying to do probably was very expensive. Yeah. 
does he have to sell his house? I don't know. I'm not in the man's pocket. Yeah. But I'm quite sure he did rack up considerable legal bills, given what he was up against. When you're fighting the federal government, yeah. the Department of Justice, yeah, that's going to require some actual serious funds. So I don't deny that. I don't dispute that. Whether yeah. he's destitute, I don't know. Broke is relative. I yeah. know what broke is. I don't think he's my type of broke. No. You know? I mean, look, <laughs> you know. He's not our kind of broke. Yeah. He, he, put it this way: if he has to liquidate assets, he's not broke. He has assets assets to liquidate. <laughs> exactly. Let's think about this. You know, exactly. if he's worth five million dollars, he has to sell his house for two point two million dollars. That's not. How's that's that? Not broke. broke. That's, that's not, not broke. That's, 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 that's called having an option. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. His, his, you know, uh, that's an interesting thing uh, uh, that everybody right now, all these big celebrities and a lot of, you know, they're like, we're all in this together. We're all going through this together. And I'm like, um, I'm not sorry. Really. Not really. No. Uh, no, you're in a yacht and I am on a piece of broken, uh, you know, uh, wood, uh, the same one that Jack Dawson was in the Titanic. Right. Uh, and then uh, the bitch pushed him off. And I was going to say, the Jack did not get any part of that wood. He was hanging out in the water. Yeah, he was like, you got to go. Um, <laughs> and she jumped him off, and she was like, I'll never miss you, Jack, but I'm freezing, so goodbye. <laughs> Just die off. Uh, so that's what I feel. Um, what... Uh, do you think is, uh, I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that this happened to you, not in, a, in not, not the, the slur, but I'm happy that you had the opportunity to go and get invited all these, all these interviews and you get to go and tell your side of the story. Um, I uh, am, am, am curious what, what thus far, which which interview that you did thus far where you were just like, you know what, that was really like, they, they made some solid points and they asked me some solid stuff rather than just general stuff that people keep asking you. It, it took a good three or four days. I think it was when I did an interview about two days ago with WABC Radio. Uh-huh. And they were responding, they wanted me to respond to Roger's uh, remarks, but they gave me the latitude to also paint a bigger picture about why he specifically was relevant in the first place and Mm -hmm. why the history of that word is the word itself was not a slur. It's the context and the intent of the word. Like for example, I can say the word Mexican or I can say the word Oriental Mm -hmm. and in a vacuum, those are not racially disparaging. You could be talking about an Oriental rug. You can just say, talk about a person's nationality being Mexican. But when you put it in the context and use the 